Lesson one, why experiment? Again, you might know why, but are you effectively, efficiently convincing the people around you? Do you have a context for how experimentation is different than, let's say, CRO or, or CXO, customer experience optimization, or the randomized control trial more specifically? Um, do you understand the goals, the principles, the benefits of experimentation, or do you have framework and language around that? That's what this initial lesson is about. The objectives here, first, you need to be able to make a strategic case for experimentation. Um, I'm gonna do that from a couple different perspectives, from the practitioner as well as the resourcer standpoint, from the CMO versus the CEO perspective. Second, understand the limitations of data and how experimentation, quote unquote, data is different. And then third, I want you to be able to contextualize experimentation by understanding a little bit of its history, especially the randomized control trial, differentiation from testing and CRO, and then and, and then some, just some quick kind of frameworks of goals, benefits, and principles of experimentation that serve for context for the rest of the course. So first we start out with the strategic narratives. And the strategic narrative here, the framework I get from Andy Raskin, and I provide a link for you um, for this, but this is, you know, why to do it. Like strategically, what's the story for why we should be doing this in the first place? And the framework that Andy Raskin uses is, is represented here. Like there's a new world, there's a new environment around us. Um, there's stakes because of that new world. There's, there's going to be winners and losers here. Um, because of this, there's, there's a new game and, and to play uh, with a magic capability and then there's associative proof because of you know, success or failure with regards to those winners and losers. Uh, so this is the rough framework that Andy Raskin uses and I like this a lot. I use this um, for, a lot, for a lot of the clients that, that we work with and just understanding like, their products and their strategic narrative that they're telling themselves and how to orient the program. But it's really useful in a lot of these um, conversations for why do something, right? So the case, the classical case for experimentation from the practitioner standpoint, and experimentation, CRO, is generally started from the marketing side, so maybe a CMO, or the product side, so chief product officer. And it looks like something like this. There's a new world, and it's filled with data. It's dataism. Data is the new religion. There's too much data going around to make quick and accurate decisions. Uh, it's hard to predict with so much data. We're making inaccurate predictions. We're, we're, we're interpreting this data incorrectly. From the customer standpoint, there's too much choice. There's too much data um, for, to uh, expect customer loyalty, right, for example. So because of this, we need to execute fast or perish, right? The winners have frameworks for action, and the losers sort of get stuck in these data traps or following sort of intuition, um, something like that, right? The new game is this experimental revolution. This was coined by some uh, MIT um, professionals just a couple of years ago. This was a great Harvard Business Review articles on this. The scientific process applied to business logic and decision making, right? This is the new game. The capability is the program, the ability to run experiments efficiently. The whole goal of program management is to lower the cost and increase the accessibility of running experiments, right? So that's the capability, these experimentation operating systems, because uh, it leads to you know more quick, faster, uh, uh, more accurate decisions, right? So program management integrated with the business growth model and the product uh, making strategies. And then finally, the proof here is that the randomized controlled trial has gone mainstream. If you go online on a daily basis, you're exposed to hundreds if not thousands of you know, randomized controlled trials every day through, through your digital experience. This strategic narrative, um, it might be a little bit new to you in this format, but you know it. Uh, as a practitioner, as an experimenter, you know the strategic narrative. This is me preaching to the choir, and that's one problem with it. Um, in terms of why experiment, I'm not convincing you because you're already doing it. You have to convince those around you, the leadership and things like that. So again, we all know these stories of you know being a, all product changes are being tested. Stories of, of companies like eBay saving you know fifty million dollars through one experiment, not even making or saving money. You know Airbnb using experimentation to confront discrimination, governments nudging to affect things like voter apathy. We know these stories. These are all over the place. Uh, so the, again, not super convincing. But when you think about expanding the footprint of experimentation, expanding your experimentation program, convincing leadership to think a little bit differently, to lead differently and have a different uh, model of leadership. 
You need a strategic narrative for why experiment from the CEO's seat, from the ultimate resourcer's seat. Um, this, one, this one is quite fun. And we've gotten a lot of success um, with this strategic narrative that it's a little bit different. The new world here is that there is an experimental revolution going on. So this is the new world, right? Um, like I already said in the last one, there's, you know, you're part of hundreds of experiments every day. So leading innovative, progressive companies experiment, right? That's the new world. The stakes. Are you able to recruit A players or B players? The winners have cultures of innovation and they allow employees to have autonomy to attract the best talent and the losers get the scraps, right? So the tech world is wrought with experimentation stories, publishing on you know, white papers on their programs, et cetera, and they are attract attracting some amazing talent because of that. And legacy players that don't have this innovation culture um, are sort of getting left behind with regards to the resourcing, right? So the new game here to play is to develop a culture of innovation and democratizing decision-making, pushing decision-making down from the C-suite into product owners, right? Leadership that accepts being wrong and focusing on resourcing and coaching rather than dictating and authority, right? This is the new game at, at play here. The magic capability is to do this, to be able to do this, to have that culture of innovation is experimentation operating systems, right? This is the ability to inspire with, with business um, operating systems that get to the why and not just the what and the how. We, we're used to leadership telling us the what and the how, uh, but really to lead, they need to start with the why. And experimentation operating systems democratizes the ability to get to the why at all levels of an organization. The proof is the great resignation. We're in the middle of it. COVID exacerbates it. We're seeing millions of people leaving their jobs and searching for better cultures. Working for organizations, tech organizations that get it, uh, that will put you in a seat and give you autonomy, give you control, and give you a system um, to, to execute um, correctly with, it, with, with that in mind. We're more and more working with these legacy companies. They experiment, but they don't know the first thing about experimentation. And there's some of them that are recognizing this more and more, not for, you know, to get wins, which of course come as a, that, that, that's what it's there for, is to improve customer experiences and, and make more money but also just to tell the story that we do have a culture of innovation uh, in order to attract better talent. And so this is a strategic narrative from the ultimate resourcers standpoint. All right, a pretty good one. So let's illustrate this. Here is uh, Sonali Shiel of Walmart Labs, right? Provides the why behind their testing program and building out the mobile grocery app for Walmart. Test to learn understand the customer, and then test to win to, to affect the customer experience, right? And then also test everything. Let's roll out whatever we roll out. Let's mitigate the risk of rolling everything out. Like this is the why behind the program. I mean, you can see some of the timeline here. They built their own platform. They built a team. They built a program. They scaled it. Uh, and there's a big focus on innovation and the use of experimentation to test everything. Uh, if you go to Walmart's career pages now, you're seeing you know, 1,135 job openings for data scientists alone right now. And see their careers page, feature content under the headline of innovation at scale. So there's a question, Would you, do you want to work for Walmart or Walmart Labs? Uh, so this speaks and illustrates the power of even a legacy retail company kind of going into the tech world, being focused on tech, uh, and leading the the fight over resources, leading the fight over talent um, by, with, with this culture of innovation stance uh, and experimentation being that mechanism that allows for this to happen. Again, democratizing decision making and, and pushing decision making down into product ownership, right? So considering these two strategic narratives, here are the problems, right? From the practitioner standpoint, we've got ad hoc approaches 
You have myths and misconceptions about experimentation and experimentation programs. From the CEO perspective, the problem being solved here is improper resourcing, uh, improper strategic integration as well, right? The solution is, I'm grouping it here as the same for either one, education, systematic approaches, proper resourcing, and integration into the business, correct integration into the business. It's not a channel, it's not a silo, it needs to be properly integrated. You know, here's a screenshot, just, just like last month, Harvard Business Review came out with a really great article and why business schools need to start to teach experimentation. And it's because of these strategic narratives um, is the, basically the justification for how experimentation can be used for more efficient decision making from the practitioner side of things and better resourcing from the resourcer uh, CEO uh, perspective, right? So I've just spoke to you about experimentation, given a couple of uh, strategic narratives, uh, experimentation being kind of the focus here. You might be asking your, uh, yourself the question, or you might have had asked yourself the question of why not data? So I want to go over to the whiteboard and, and do a short section on this and how uh, data from experimentation is different than you know, the data that we're used to looking at and really focus on that and how data that we're used to looking at from, from analytics, from big data, from customer research um, is not so different from intuition. Uh, and, 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 and then I'll come back and tell you how experimentation data is uh, pretty unique. Cool, so here's a section on why experiments and why not just use data and what makes data and experiments different or the data that comes from experiments quite different than the normal data that we might at have at hand, for example, from analytics or from customer research and customer data. Um, so first of all, you have to think about a business and its core mission, um, and you might think it's growth, um, but it's not. The core mission of the business should be to be adaptable and uh, be able to make decisions, accurate decisions, very quickly. Uh, think about the, the purpose or the goal of evolution. It's not growth, it's adaptability, resilience, anti-fragility, um, the ability for when the environment changes, for that individual, that or organism, that business to be able to adapt uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so this is our, this is the purpose with data: is to use this to make fast, accurate decisions um, as fast as possible, as accurate as possible. So we're steering that ship, um, um, you know, in, a, in an agile way. Uh, so this is where the distinction between data and experiments kind of comes in, and kind of we, we want to play with this a little bit. A lot of people put a dividing line in between data and intuition, but I don't. I want to not do that or, or show you a way that actually combines the traditional data that we usually have at hand and intuition and explains why, why these things shouldn't be divorced. Um, and then kind of bring in experimentation um, in, here in a second as the antidote or as a su big supplement um, to what we traditionally use as data. You see, data that we have at hand, uh, the data from analytics, uh, the data from the environment around us, is what we see. And this type of data is used for prediction. I have a long history of doing prediction. Um, I spent 10 years in academia doing predictive models, uh, doing climate change predictions all over North America for the Department of the Interior, doing species distribution modeling and prediction, um, looking at you know, how changes in the environment and the ecosystem will, would reflect in changes in species distributions when thinking about endangered species and things like that. Uh, the data that we have at hand, um, again, it could be big data, it could be machine learning data, you know, supervised, unsupervised machine, machine learning algorithms and such. It's all data that we see and therefore we use it for prediction. But there's a big problem in that, in this type of data, in the types of questions, the level of questions that we're able to answer with this type of activity being seeing, right? Observing, getting data, observing it, and making a conclusion, a prediction on what will happen afterwards, right? And the problem has to do with our information processing and how we process data. Uh, so generally, if you collect a lot of data, First of all, the collection of data itself can be very biased, but we won't even get into that. But say you collect, collect a bunch of data. The next step is to start for lo looking for patterns and start to group this data into information, right? That's the next step. So you start with data, 
and then you get into information, and then you're slowly going to find uh, themes around the data, right? As you look for patterns, you're looking for similarity, dissimilarity, correspondence, sequence, things like that. There's a lot of ways to, a lot of different types of patterns, a lot of ways to look for data. Um, but what you're going, um, what you're effectively doing is going from that data to information, which is group data, over to knowledge. And it's with knowledge that you can make good predictions and good decisions um, and, and kind of steer the ship and be adaptable, right? But effectively what you're going, to, what you're doing is traveling from the real over to the abstract. Or as Richard Feynman would say, you're going from the names of something to something, right? And the, the, the weak link here and how intuition is not divorced from data is that it's these leaps where intuition comes in. As you pattern find, um, that's where things get go astray, um, so to speak, right? The thing is, is that there's problems with data and how we interpret data. If there's too much data, um, the bizarre things, the funny things will stick out to us, right? Um, we see quick changes in data, not slow changes really well at all. Our minds don't process this really well, or machines don't even process this really well, again, because they're predicting as well based on our inputs. We're drawn to details that confirm our existing beliefs, right? Uh, we notice flaws in others before ourselves, right? Um, and there's also problems with not enough data, gap filling, right? We tend to find stories and patterns with very sparse data. We fill in gaps from stereotypes. We imagine things and people we know as being better, right? We simplify probabilities and numbers to make them easier to think about. We, we, we think we know, um, know what others are thinking. Uh, there's problems in how we interpret this. And this is how data that we see is wrought with problems uh, when we, because we're using our in intuition uh, to interpret it. There's a really good quote by Rory Sutherland in the book Alchemy. He says that people run on logic as much as a horse runs on petrol, right? People are willing to spend more money when a restaurant is named Studio 97 than when it's named Studio 17. Wine tastes better if it's poured from a heavier bottle. Painkillers work better when people believe they are expensive. We fundamentally cannot separate data and intuition when we're seeing, when we're observing data, right? And that's where experimentation comes in to save the day. That's where experimentation is fundamentally different because we're not just seeing data with experimentation. We're doing, we're intervening, we're changing the environment at, um, to see what happens after, right? It's not just seeing, it's doing. Um, so. Here, next, we go into some of the core, these core limitations of data uh, and explicitly talk about how experimentation is different. Okay, we're back. So here, kind of in a nice slide, are the three primary limitations of data. Data in the context of the data that we have readily available, all, kind of all around us in analytics, for example. Generalizability. Data is not generalizable generally. <laughs> Uh, the greater the novelty of kind of the change of environment, the innovation, the less likely that the data at hand, the data available is useful. Transferability. The data itself is very context dependent. And you hear this all the time of not using best practices and, and how where best practices fail and uh, best practices not accounting for a particular nuance or, or, or business vertical uh, context, etc. Uh, it's not very transferable, especially in space, maybe vertical to vertical, industry to industry, or time. What worked last year, not going to work this year. So transferability is a big issue. And then the last one, probably the most important one, the more powerful one, is correlation, not causation. Data from, a, you know, data that we see, uh, data that is seen and observed, uh, speaks to correlation. It's associative. It's what we see. It doesn't speak to the mechanisms at hand. Analysis of big data um, is, is also about this too. It's about correlation, not causation. Uh, and it has a hard time getting at the mechanisms um, that actually caused something, right? And so how is experimentation data different? Um, and where is it different? This is where I bring in Pearl's causality tiers. So at the bottom of the ladder, at the bottom of this tier ladder is data that we see. It's data 
that all organisms, um, most, most robots, are able to perform this function. It's associative, right? The activity here is seeing and observing. You know, does a, does a symptom tell me something about a disease? Does survey tell us something about the results, um, et cetera, right? But it's, it's just seeing, and the activity is prediction. All right, are the relevant activity here and what we're talking about. We're making a prediction of what something will happen. The second causality tier is doing, and this is the intervention. This is doing, intervening, changing the environment, and then measuring the results of, of what happens after, right? If I take an aspirin, will my headache be cured? And you can run a trial on that. This is where the randomized controlled trial comes in. This is a, a tier, a next rung up on the ladder because it enables us to ask more sophisticated questions and get data that's in a different format that's able to get closer to the cause um, to, you know, compared to the data that is just observed. Finally, the, one, the third level is the counterfactual. And this one is imagining. This is one that humans are really good at. Uh, it's not one that really we need to geek out about in this course. Um, that goes into more philosophy and it's fun to think about. But really where I bring in Pearl's causality ladder is to show you the distinction between data from an associa association standpoint, from a seeing standpoint, compared to data from an intervention standpoint. Um, and that's where experimentation comes in. And it's fundamentally different than data that you might see in analytics, for example. That's why it's so powerful. Okay, I've got a quick uh, rapid fire section here that goes through some elements of context, placing experimentation in context. First is a, uh, one slide on the history of the experiments, specifically the randomized controlled trial. Second is uh, a slide on uh, the places experimentation in context versus testing and CRO. And then third, uh, a few slides that each go into uh, a framework or some language around what's the goal of experiments, what are the primary benefits of experiments, and what are the principles of experiments. And these we might refer back to again and again throughout the course, and so it's good to kind of pr um, bring them up here, or provide that context, but they're, you know, even they themselves are nice little frameworks to, to think about and uh, to refer back to. Okay, a really quick uh, one-slider on the history of the trial. I start with the start of the scientific process, the scientific method, and that's with Francis Bacon back in 1620. Um, you know, before that was Descartes, um, it was deductive reasoning. Francis Bacon really kind of brings us inductive reasoning and the necessary language for the randomized control trial, experimentation generally to start uh, to gather a foothold. Psychology was the field that really started to do a lot of randomized control trials. The first psychology lab in 1879 in Germany. You know that led to a lot of studies by B.F. You know B.F. Skinner, William James, um, Pavlov, and things like that. Uh, uh, so a lot of really cool kind of foundational, seminal work in the field of psychology. The field of psychology met the field of economics only in the 1970s and 80s. Right, so and that birthed the, this this new kind of um, you know bastard child field of behavioral economics, and so this is where Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky come into play, specifically with prospect theory, which kind of bridges these two fields. Before that, you know, economists weren't doing any randomized controlled trial; it was kind of stuck over in, in psychology. Uh, only in the 70s and 80s did this thing kind of come together. And then, of course, in the 2000s, you've got the culmination of a lot of data associated with human behaviors of consumption, sort of the explosion of the e-commerce industry and the e-commerce field. So you start to get um, the ability to do experimentation for the masses only 20 years ago. Right? So a little bit of, a, of, of some context for the randomized controlled trial and where we are today. Right. Now, some context on experimentation versus some of these other terms and these other, other kind of fields that you might think about. Defining experimentation. On the left here, I have experimentation. Uh, so that's the process, the operating system. It's the full program and, and project management components, right? Uh, it can be applied anywhere, but generally it's, it's product focused, uh, marketing focused. But it's, again, it's the whole suite of activities from finding the right problem, 
you know, planning the solution and acting on it, right? Put that in context with A-B testing itself. This is more of the task or the tactic at hand, right? This is the randomized controlled trial. There's a lot of ways to experiment. A-B testing uh, just happens to be a really common one right now. I think we're gonna see an explosion of different types of and flavors of, of that tactic of, of how you get the data, um, how you are intervening. A lot of quasi-experimentation methods are, are coming uh, to light right now. Uh, especially. And then now put that in context with conversion rate optimization or customer experience optimization, right? This is a mindset, more of a channel focus, so you're focused on either a goal metric like revenue or you're focused on a goal metric like customer experience. Uh, but these are also some suitcase terms. Um, they get used um, kind of interchangeably with experimentation and A-B testing as well. Generally, they're focused on, on these binary driver metrics like conversion rate, um, NPS, or something like that. Uh, those are the, the, the driver metrics that, that, that these kind of focus to. And they generally live in marketing, I would say, a little bit less so in product, so with the exception maybe of, of um, some product-led growth companies like SaaS companies that are doing a lot of customer experience optimization, measuring engagement within the product might be the exception. So some, a few definitions here are to put these in contrast with each other. Uh, that can help us as we go through the course as well. And then finally, um, some sections of context for primary goals, benefits, and principles starting out with three broad goals or focal areas for testing. This is where we bring in um, that, that history of the randomized control trial comes in handy. Because you look here, you've got this one goal bucket of revenue, and this is what I call the economist focus, right? Understanding the outcome, usually margin focused, value focused, focusing on these goal metrics of you know, revenue or revenue per visitor, things like that. You also have a broad goal centered around the customer, and this is really the, the psychologist. Um, so understanding the path, such as the individual's behavior, the motivations, the perceptions, right? A learning focus, focused on customer experience, most notably. But you also have the operator, right? process, right? keeping the lights on within a business, improving efficiencies of teams. You can use experimentation as a tool to focus here as well. And there's a lot of more sophisticated experimentation programs that are doing just that, changing the way they sell, changing the way that data is routed in order to make marketing jobs more efficient, changing the way that product is researched. Um, so experimentation can be used as a measurement tool to change process as well as customer metrics, as well as revenue metrics. And so these are the three broad goal focal areas for experimentation. Now, three broad benefits. The previous slide was sort of why or what, how we're orienting um, as a tool, but these are kind of what we get out of it when we do orient in a particular direction. So first, you start out with the why, a theory versus mechanism. So understanding the, the reasoning behind the effect. A really cool story here of, of you know, I, I gave the example earlier, Airbnb trying to understand um, you know, why discrimination was taking place within their platform. Was it that hosts you know, um, had bad prior experiences with a particular demographic in that, in that you know, famous uh, case with African Americans? Or you know, was it not? So experimentation allowed the measurement uh, to get closer to understanding the cause of the problem, and it, w it was discrimination. It wasn't that they had pre previous bad experiences with African Americans. They actually, African Americans, they actually hadn't had any experiment experience with them. Um, there was, you know, discrimination going on. So it allowed them to, to understand, you know, what was causing it so they can approach uh, some mitigate, mitigating factors and mitigating ways to control that, that platform. The second broad benefit area is ha having to do with the magnitude and trade-offs of the effect. Uh, and this is the one that we are pretty familiar with. What's the lift on conversion rate? But also, what's the trade-off of that is one that's maybe not looked at so commonly. If we increase conversion rate, how does that affect AOV? If we increase conversion rate short term with a bunch of promotions, promotions, how does that affect lifetime value? And are we training our customers and clients to uh, need these, these promotions uh, continuously, right? The third bucket is fact finding. And this is sort of that risk mitigation game. This is really common with product teams and doing feature releases and doing code releases. Try not to break things uh, situations. So this one's focused on risk. 
um, uh, and understanding risk and, and kind of pinning in uh, where the risk might be as we want to move faster and release more things, release more code. And then finally, three broad principles of experimentation. And this comes from notably Stefan Tom Silk Experimentation Works. I'll, I'll provide a link in the resources area, um, but I really like this framework, thinking about the broad principles of experimentation, experimentation programs. If you believe in this mindset, um, this, these are principles to, to work towards continuously. Decision focus is test everything that can be tested. This is a bit of a controversial one. Uh, some people think that this is a, a myth. Um, there's, a, there's programs, you know, Petco, for example, a famous uh, program that, that was experimenting quite a lot, a lot of volume, and they've recently reeled it back, you know, going from hundreds of tests a year to, to less than 100, maybe like 70, 75 tests last year. Uh, because they only wanted to focus on tests that, that achieve their mission to be more innovative. Uh, and so they reeled things back a little bit and didn't test, consciously didn't test everything. Um, but generally it's a good direction or a good vector to go in, um, uh, a good principle to have. Uh, and then you can ask more intelligent questions as you hit some diff you know, different types of tests and uh, whether you want them or not. The second principle is um, more of a, you know, the, a, a scale focus, investing in your systems uh, to increase accessibility, trust, and velocity. They need to be resourced. And then the third principle uh, is alignment focus. This has the principle of simplifying, simplifying, simplifying results. If you want to get better results out of your experimentation program, if you want to amplify the reach and engagement with the teams, if you want to broaden up the, uh, the footprint of experimentation uh, and, and really have that operating system be part of the culture of the business, uh, then the results have to be incredibly simple. Um, yeah, and just fundamentally, we've got these three principles. It's a nice framework from Stefan uh, Tomp, but from a program standpoint, lower the cost of experimentation and increase the accessibility of it. Those are two big ones that I like to think about as well. Recapping this lesson, so you now understand a little bit more of the why of experimentation. You've got those two strategic narratives, one from a practitioner standpoint, one from a resourcer standpoint. You understand um, why data isn't enough. You allowed me to go through my, my, my soapbox, my diatribe on, on data and, and how, it's a little, how experimentation data, how intervention data is a little bit different than uh, data that we only observe. You can define experimentation now versus testing in CRO, and you have a clear set of, you know, some frameworks of core goals, benefits, and principles for experimentation programs.